two of uh, Lazarus, John 11. We're going to probably do part three next week. We're going to finish, finish up with Lazarus next week. But it's a pretty far-fetched story. And uh, there's a lot of far-fetched ideas. Did anybody take any pictures of the sky on Friday? Boy, uh, I, my Facebook lit up. I think it was Friday when uh, SpaceX was launched. And everybody, uh, nobody knew what it was, and so there was the craziest ideas. I guess it was SpaceX. That's what they tell us anyway. But I looked at the picture a little bit more closely. I don't know. But uh, there was a lot of far-fetched ideas. I guess uh, Elon Musk e even said that it was what he said it was a nuclear UFO from North Korea, something like that, to to mess with people. But I was thinking about far-fetched stories, and really, this idea of Lazarus being dead for four days is the most far-fetched miracle in the Gospels. And if I didn't believe that Jesus rose from the dead, I wouldn't believe the Lazarus story. But we have great evidence and reason to believe that, La that Jesus really did rise from the dead. And there is a lot of history around this, this Lazarus story. When you go to the, the Holy Land, they, they uh, open up a tomb that they say this was the place. And you just wonder if the history is all connected or not. But it definitely impacted the people there. And uh, the, it, it showed Jesus' mastery over life and death. And he, it, you know, remember last week we said he delayed a couple days, so he was four days late. And it, you get the sense of, well, it seemed like Jesus just showing off. But he was showing his authority and his mastery over death. And, and really, death is his greatest adversary. The Bible, uh, Paul tells us, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. So as we open up his word today, let's ask the Lord to give us wisdom and give us life and uh, transform us by his word. Father, we thank you that this, this story, that you took time to pray with and, and cry with people, that you took on human flesh and you walked into the drama and the tragedy of their lives. Lord, we pray that, that uh, we will see uh, the divinity of Jesus and the humanity of Jesus and that we will be more like you, more able to uh, weep for others because we, we paused and we studied today. And we ask that your Holy Spirit, who inspired John to write this, that the same Holy Spirit will transform and, and download it into our hearts, that your Spirit will do what our efforts cannot do and uh, make us more and more alive in you, Christ Jesus. Amen. Now, we remember last week we said that... Uh, that Jesus delayed, and it seemed like Martha was kind of waiting for him, <laughs> like she wasn't very happy with him. And it, part of it is the relationship. We, we're told all the time we have relationship with Jesus. And in one sense, that's great to know that he loves us, but it even adds a personal aspect to it when we pray for things that we really, really need. I mean, how much did she really need him there? and then he doesn't show up. So besides the loss of her brother, it's the fact that, that she knew Jesus. He had been to their house bunches of times, and when they really, really needed him, and it was a real emergency, he wasn't there. And that's a lot like our life, too. When we've been praying and praying, oh, Lord, heal this disease, heal this loved one, change this relationship, bring new life here, and he doesn't show up. And, and the bonus goes to somebody, you know, the new job promotion goes to somebody much, much less qualified, maybe not even a believer. And we see uh, other people excelling, and we might be frustrated or, or fearful of failure. And where are you, Jesus, when we're having these difficult times? And let's consider the condition that we left Lazarus in last week. He was not just dead, but he was completely dead. And he's in a bad place. Well, maybe he was in a good place, but his body was a wreck. And I want you to think about your condition this week. <laughs> However, whatever your condition is, whatever your concerns are, whatever you're worried about, you're not worse off than Lazarus. And yet the Lord could uh, reach down and touch him. So Mar Martha, she sent the word to Jesus. And I was thinking about the word she sent. You know, she, sent, she didn't mention Lazarus in the, in the cryptic memo that she gave to Jesus, the one you love. 
is sick. And I was thinking, you know, maybe that's just because she didn't want people to know that, that Jesus was operating so much under the radar that she didn't want this message to be intercepted by anyone, that, that they might be waiting for Jesus. Even when they heard that Lazarus' friend was dying and dead, they might have been waiting and laying in wait for him. They might have sent false mourners to go there because the Jews were so, the Jewish leadership was so determined to, to find and kill Jesus at this time. Four times they'd, t they'd made an attempt on his life, holding stones and preparing to throw them. So Jesus does finally get to Bethany, right near Jerusalem. Remember last week we said uh, that uh, Thomas said, do you really want to go there? Well, let's, let's go with him, even if it means we'll die with him. And so now he gets to Martha, and Martha says, we start with this question we, uh, we, were, we addressed last week, but he, Martha says to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And we feel that with every tragedy we walk through, when we feel like this is too much, this shouldn't be happening. Lord, if you were here now, if you were here, Lord, maybe I wouldn't have been abused or misused. If you had been here, I, I wouldn't have felt this injustice. If you had been here, but even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. So I, I know you can do it, but, but why do you hold your hand back? Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on, at the last day. And I was thinking more about this this week and was glad to revisit it. Which is better? You get the sense, yeah, 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 I know he's going to rise at the last day. He's going to be part of the resurrection, but that's really not what I'm asking for. That's really not the miracle I want, but which is better? As we think about the ones that we love that maybe we've said goodbye to, we might say, oh, I, I want him to live, but really what matters the most is that they're part of the resurrection in the last day. So even as we, we gather our families, you know, for Christmas, and, and we might say, oh, we might miss somebody who's not here this year. Or we might see somebody in poor health this year. The most important thing, the assurance we want to have is that they know Jesus. And we want to just make the most out of every opportunity. So we want to keep that in mind. It, it's so easy to be so worried and stressed about so many things at Christmas time. But really only one is necessary. And, and, and we're looking for that opportunity to make him known. And really, as we look back at this miracle, Jesus said, uh, throughout this miracle, I'm glad it happened for your sakes. I'm, I'm glad that he died for your sakes, that you might see the glory of God. This suffering's going to happen, that he might reveal his glory. And as we think about all the suffering that we have in our lives, its purpose is that it will reveal his glory. And we can say, yeah, we know that you have the power, Lord Jesus. We know that you're going to receive glory even in this. And yet we want you to intercede. We know that you have the power. You're holding your hand back. But now we're going to believe that your glory is going to be revealed in this. That when we get to the end of our lives, when we stand before that resurrection day, when he wipes away every tear in our, from our eyes, we're going to say, we get it now. Paul tells us we see it like in a mirror dimly now. But when we stand on the other side, we know it's all going to make sense and it's going to be beautiful to us. And we wouldn't look back on anything and say, Lord, uh, that, that, that's the tragedy I underwent, that suffering, that injustice, it had an impact. If I could have just trusted you more and your purpose, Lord, you were faithfully shaping me into the image of your son. She says, I know he will rise again, the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? This was the time to ask her, right in the midst of the tragedy. And it's the time to ask us when we're going through it. Do you believe it? Do you really believe he loves you? He has the power to save you, to rescue you from this predicament, but he's not and it's still going to be for your benefit, that he works all things to the good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. 
do you believe this? It's, it's more than a, a creed that we say. <laughs> we affirm our faith every week, but when we go through it, imagine to hear Jesus say, do you believe this? It might take us back, but what a beautiful thing if we can say, I do believe. She says to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. And when she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called to Mary, her sister, saying, the teacher has come and is calling for you. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came after him. Now those Jesus had not, uh, now Jesus had not come yet into the town, but was in the place where Martha had met him. Then the Jews who were with Mary in the house comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying, she is going to the tomb to weep there. These people were much loved, and there were a lot of folks in their house trying to give Mary comfort. And you get the sense that maybe Martha's kind of a controlling person. I get that sense from the other accounts that we have of Mary and Martha. And Martha's doing everything and upset that her that Jesus isn't telling Mary to do more. But I get the sense that, that, that Mary just is uh, an open book with her emotions. And when she hears that Jesus is there, she's out and quick running to him. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And somehow, it's the same question that Martha asked, but I see a whole different expression here. I see Mary just flopping at his feet, almost bursting into tears, if you'd only been here. In my life, I kind of do both. I have both these responses. I walk through them when I go through tragedy. I walk through the blame game. Jesus, if you were here, Jesus, why didn't you do this? Why don't you intervene even now? And sometimes I just burst out crying and let it out and say, okay, I just need your grace. I just need your grace. And I don't know if these are steps of grief or whatever it is, but I do find that when I'm going through difficult situations, sometimes I'm questioning or sometimes I'm just saying, Lord, if, you, if you're here, let me have more grace. I love the way Paul deals with it. He has this request. He calls it a thorn in his flesh. We don't really know what it was, but it was something he wanted deliverance from. Three times he prayed, and then Jesus gives him an answer. How satisfying would that be? But not the answer he wanted. My grace is sufficient for you. This, is a, this malady that you're suffering is a messenger from Satan. He's reminding you. I'm letting Satan burden your body with this so that you don't get prideful. Wow. God cared more about Paul to keep his pride in check than to heal him physically. Who knows what problems in our lives God is keeping at bay by the suffering that he permits in our life and what character he is developing by the trials that he lets us walk through. And we're, it's revealed to us that his purpose is that we will have, that we will share in the resurrection with him and we are being conformed and shaped into the image of his son and it has to, there has to be struggle for it to happen. And when it comes to life and death, these are the struggles that seem like they're too much to us. But if we see it from the eternal perspective, imagine things from Lazarus' point of view. There he is in the presence of God, and he gets a knock. Martha and Mary are asking you to go back. Wow. Really? That's the worst part for him. Really? And so he has to walk. Uh, so, so Jesus calls him back. And he has to walk on this life again with all his weaknesses. And, and then he, in 30 years, perhaps, or more or less, he has to die again. And I would bet most of us, I bet most of us, if we said, are you afraid to be in heaven? We'd say, no. Maybe even looking forward to being in heaven. 
but it's that transition from life to new life that's the most upsetting. Lord, make it quick, painless, die in my sleep, not drawn out, slow. Lazarus gets to do that twice. But Jesus said in all of this, it's that God receives glory. I'm glad it happened so that you folks would see, so that God would receive glory. So it could be written down by John so that we can read this now and know it happened and God receives glory. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? Jesus is now walking through a real grieving family. They said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. Everybody's weeping. There might have been Jews that were infiltrating from the Jewish leadership. They came down. There were even sometimes uh, uh, there was a tradition of professional mourners that would be wailing and weeping just to make sure everybody knows that folks were sad. And then there were the genuine comforters who really cared for Martha and Mary. And, and there are probably other people who really genuinely loved Lazarus. And they're weeping for their own loss like Mary and Martha are. And Jesus sees all of this and he weeps. And that strikes me because every day that Jesus walked on the earth, people were dying. He walked through past as many funerals as we must drive past. And yet at this one, he weeps. What's that about? This is the one Jesus loved. What's that about? When Jesus was here, he could have spent his whole life healing the sick. But he was always at the right place at the right time, even here where it looked like he was four days too late. As the Lord directs us to be his ambassadors and walks us through life, he gives us two eyes and two hands to minister to what's in front of us. I think it's important to think about this because we're at a place now where we can turn on the TV and we can see the suffering all around the world. And it can overwhelm us. We can see, we can go online and Google some Christian persecution and see so much suffering, such tragic stories, such uh, atrocities that really to have this large eye, either our computer or our television screen, those aren't the eyes that God really gave us. God's given us two eyes to just see the world that's in front of us and to love the people who he places there. Almost like we say, give us our daily bread. Give us our daily people to love and minister to and be loved by. And it takes a certain amount of discipline to, to turn the rest off and to be there as Jesus was always there in the moment. And here he is weeping with a family that's grieving. And that's why he says, you know, it's to your advantage that I go. Because here, when he had his earthly ministry, he just had the same two eyes that you and I have. But he says, it's to your advantage that I go, that the Holy Spirit might dwell in us and, and virtually deputize us to be his hands and his eyes to minister and to weep with those who weep and comfort those with the comfort we received from him. It's, it's such an amazing strategic plan as he pushes, about, uh, pushes against death and empowers us to be part of the plan. Then Jesus said, uh, then they said, see how he loved him? And some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? And this is a philosophical question we hear all the time, sometimes by sincere questioners and sometimes by naysayers. If your God is capable of miracles, why do good people suffer? How many books have been written on that topic? And yet, really, the only philo philosophy that I know of that, that coherently deals with it in a way that's satisfying is this amazing story of grace in a fallen world where uh, death reigns now, but God will vanquish it. I think when Jesus was weeping at this funeral, he also had in his mind the whole global situation of death, his adversary. And he weeps for our human condition, and it's been God's plan. 
I don't think he was, I don't even think it's his plan B. I think it's his plan one. That our parents in their rebellion would reject him so that he could manifest a love for us that we would never, to know the love of the Redeemer suffering Christ is even greater than the love of God in his creation. It's one thing to create us. It's another thing to walk in and put on human flesh and die in our place to vanquish death. That's a love that we would never know if there was never a fall. Could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Yes, he could have. He'll prove that he could have. But so often, and most often, he doesn't. And he says, whoever lives and believes in me will never die. That's the resurrection. Do you believe this? Yeah, we look in this life dimly and we see people die. We see our Christian uh, cemeteries are full of people. <laughs> but Jesus hasn't forgotten them. They haven't missed out. In fact, the dead in Christ will rise first. It's the resurrection's the real party, friends. That's the real hope. That's the real glory. That's th this life uh, is important in that it points to it, but it is not the final say. Then Jesus again, groaning in himself. This is, you know, the 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 Greek gods and the Roman gods. They were noted, n notorious for not caring about the plight of human beings. And this is a God who takes on human flesh and weeps and groans. Again, groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, take the stone away. And Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench. She said, Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe you have the power of the resurrection. And when he's ready to do a miracle, he says, take the stone away. No, 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 stop. <laughs> it's going to smell. Don't embarrass the family. Don't do this, Jesus. He's been dead for days. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you will see the glory of God? This red letter line is as true for us as it ever was for Mary and Martha. If you believe, you will see. Maybe not in this lifetime, but in the great resurrection, you will see the glory of God. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. This is a great proof text for open prayer. That it's appropriate that when we gather together, we have public prayer. And uh, Jesus saying, look, I could just be saying this to you, Father, but I want other people to hear. This is corporate prayer. This is uh, something I would urge you to think about as you celebrate with your families Christmas. Maybe tonight uh, there'll be a, a little battle inside of you. <laughs> Should I say grace? And, and there might be a panic button. Yeah, I want to say grace, but maybe it seem a little awkward. Or maybe before you, you open presents tomorrow, whenever you gather your family, hey, let's just stop and, and thank the Lord for his greatest gift. And it's so easy for all the busyness of Christmas to, to push Jesus out of the manger, but it's so much the point that Jesus was in the manger and Jesus has the power over life and death. And we don't want to miss a Lazarus story in Christmas because of all the distraction. So, this, so Jesus is praying out loud, not so God hears him, but so others hear him, and we should do the same. Now, when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And almost every commentary loves to make this little quip that if he didn't say Lazarus and just said, come forth, all the graves would have emptied. <laughs> so I thought I'd pass that along. But how beautiful are these words and the command of Christ. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes. And his face was wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said, loose him and let him go. You know, I almost thought, this is, 
This is such a uh, over-the-top story, such a memorable experience for everyone there to, to have the proof of the stink coming out of the grave and have him come out wrapped in the death clothes. I almost thought, you know what, but for this sermon, maybe I ought to wrap myself up, come on out here in death clothes and, and tell you the story from Lazarus' perspective. Loose him and let him go. We're dead in our sins, and, and we're given new life. Now, this uh, I'm kind of making a spiritual application here, but this is a real story. It's interesting. Jesus does perform the miracle. Jesus could have just moved the, moved the, done a Jedi move and moved the stone away. He could have taken the, clo- the, the, the wrapping off of him, but he allows the people there to participate in the miracle. And this, it just reminds me so much of when we're called to life and we become new believers. If you share your faith or you see someone receive Jesus in a service, they, they go from death to life, don't they? Spiritual death to real spiritual life. They're new creation. And you know what? They still have some grave clothes. And he says, take off the grave clothes. And you know, that was the, it took a lot of guts maybe to move the stone but, oh, you know, they didn't have rubber gloves back then. I wouldn't want to touch those, those grave, the, the, the grave dressing. But he asked them to do this. And then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen these things, Jesus did believe in him. And next week we're going to talk about those who didn't believe and how they would react to this most astounding miracle. But I want to explore this idea of being dead and made alive. I want to explore this analogy. I think it's a fair analogy. It doesn't change the fact that this is real history. But Paul explains our experience of new life, and he says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. This is what we used to be. We shouldn't be surprised that other people that haven't received him yet are still walking in this deadness, pursuing things that lead to death. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of God's wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ when we were dead in our transgressions. Nothing we could do. We were in a predicament that was beyond our ability to redeem it. And we needed God to do, according to his great plan, to rescue us. It is by grace, unmerited favor, it is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In in a spiritual sense, we're there, but here we're still wrestling with grave, grave clothes, aren't we? In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. We don't often show our grave clothes. They bind us just as much. In fact, I, you know, I always, I, I wear mine underneath. See, I always have some of my grave clothes here. Don't usually want you to see them. <laughs> uh, you know, these are the terrible things. That I, uh, the ways I still think like the flesh, like the old man, or the things I still do that I shouldn't do. And I mean, these are so smelly. And yet, yet Jesus left these on Lazarus and asked somebody else to peel them off. Well, you're never going to peel them off if I never, if I've never even mentioned them to you. If I just keep them hidden all the time. So it just made me think that while He does this miracle of new life, He calls us to to have fellowship one with another. And it, and and sometimes it means we have to be close enough <laughs> to smell that humanity and that fallenness and that brokenness and to remind us, hey, there is new life under there. You don't have to be connected to the old things and the old ways. We're in a process of being made more and more like him. Let's uh, ask the Lord that we could put away the old childish things, and it's a process, and more and more. And as we think about this Christmas today, what a beautiful day and tomorrow. 
uh, we'll be with friends and we can uh, and loved ones and we can be mindful that this story that we read is real in history and that it impacts us so much that it changes our life and the old ways are going away and we can be part of this process of, of not just our own self but helping others be set free let's pray Father, we thank you for the many miracles you do and the way you surprise us. And as soon as we try to put you in a box, you, you bust open and you surprise us. And it's, as soon as we see the power that you have, then sometimes you just recede your hand and allow us to be your hands. And we feel like maybe you've turned your eyes away, but no, your, your Holy Spirit is filling up all kinds of believers to be your eyes and to be your ears, to be the means of your resources, admonishing, correcting, loving, confessing our sins one to another, revealing ourselves to one another so that we see that your grace is real and your love is unending and your, your fellowship and, and your heaven and your communion has already begun here to the extent that we, we take off the masks and we bask in your love. Oh Lord, I love it that Paul identifies that we all were like that and we, we all still are easily entangled by the, the sins of this world. Lord, I, I would ask you, invite your Holy Spirit right now. What is it? What are the grave clothes that you want me to leave behind in 2017? The thoughts, the habitual uh, thoughts and actions that are of the old life that will just to gratify uh, not just our, our deeds but also our thoughts of the flesh Lord deliver us today give us this image that we are already seated in the heavenly realms we're already set free we're alive in the tomb and we get to just walk free and be uh, able to do your purposes here on earth Lord that we get to bind the wounds and heal and uh, love and, and comfort one another with the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, help us to walk in your purpose for our lives and make us uh, eager and ready to serve one another, serve your purposes, extend your kingdom, be in discipleship, love one another for your glory this Christmas all year long. In Jesus' name.